This is Al Snow, and you're listening to, yeah, that's right, another wrestling podcast. God, please set my hair on fire. It's time for uh, another wrestling podcast with your hosts, Steve Credo and Jonathan Benjamin. All right, all right, all right. Jonathan? Yes. This is episode 28. Yes, it is. Uh, wow, it's another wrestling podcast. I'm Steve Credo. And I'm Jonathan Benjamin. And welcome to another... Oh, oh, oh I see how it is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank oh, wait, you. wait, let me try that. If that seems to be the thing happening... All right, all right, let me try this, Jonathan. Whatever, Mr. Sound Effects guy. Okay, here we go. And I'm Steve Credo. You motherfucker. <laughs> All right, but anyway, guys, regardless of the sound effects, you know who we are. This is another wrestling podcast, episode twenty-eight. Uh, a lot of a lot of stuff's got happening, Jonathan, uh, with you and your sound effects over there. But uh, hey, guys, welcome to another show. Welcome to another wrestling podcast where we're going to talk about anything and everything wrestling. Uh, we have a kind of a unique topic uh, in store. But before we get to that, Jonathan, do you know who's joining us today on a very special episode? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I think it's going to be our best show ever. And I'm going to hold you to it. Ever. Um, we will be talking to the owner, creator, the Alpha and Omega of FWE. Jordan Schneider will be here in the studio with us today. Awesome. Um, and for those of you who think, hmm, that's uh, that's great. <laughs> we got something. We, yeah, we've got, a, we've got another bonus for you. Yeah. Um, we have none other than the lovely winter. Just in time for winter, actually. You know, it's December. And uh, December 21st is the first day of winter. And hey, this is happening before the first day of winter because we have winter on the show. Yeah, we have premature winter on the show. (laughs) Doesn't sound that good, but hey, yo, she's lovely. She'll be joining us pretty soon. So we have Jordan and winter coming up pretty soon. Uh, Guys, stay tuned for that. It's going to be a great time to listen. A great, enjoyable uh, ear... Um, what can we say for your ears? What, what's ear something? candy. Ear candy. I love it. That's what we're going to start saying from now on. Because it's the holidays. <laughs> we, could, we could do a really uh, a calm show and, uh, you know, just like whisper uh, ear candy. I love it's, ear candy. That's going to be a great show with ear candy. Ear candy. Wow, Jonathan, we are live once again in person, in living color. In living color. And CM Punk's not even here, but uh, who? Exactly, he may have broke the internet, but we are going to barely dent it tonight. We're gonna fix it. (laughs) We're gonna fix it because it's broken. (laughs) We're gonna fix it with our show. World, thank you guys. Uh, So while you're listening to everybody else's wrestling podcast, make sure you tune into another wrestling podcast. That's right, because that's what we're doing, guys. Uh, Great time. Thanks for listening. Make sure you tweet us. Make sure you Facebook us. And but more importantly, subscribe, rate, review us. Give us all those good thumbs up, five stars, all those fancy things you, you could do for somebody because we would do it for you, right? Absolutely, and we have for most of you. So just keep that in mind whenever you're listening and you're like, eh, I don't think I should re- rate and review these guys. Well, you should. Because we yeah. did it for you. Calm down. It's yeah. all right. So, you know, but hey, come on, guys. Uh, we, we have a lot more show to go to. But, Jonathan, well, let's talk about something this week. Uh, we got a new topic coming up. Uh, it's, yeah, it's this, kind of a topic this, we never talked about. So. It is, and it's one of the topics that came off of our uh, Twitter. Somebody mentioned it and said that we should talk about it. So today we are going to talk about what? Yeah, we're going to talk about the worst gimmicks. Okay, well, I don't know that it's the the worst. Maybe let's let's say unfortunate gimmicks. Maybe like I see, I see what you're saying. Yeah, a series of miss or a series of unfortunate gimmicks, pretty yeah, much. like a lemony snicket for you. There you go, guys. Uh, okay, so I get what We're you're saying. We're cultured. So, we read books. I, I just saw the movie, but uh, it's still... I read books. <laughs> I watch movies. <laughs> there uh, we go. Uh, that's all we could do. Uh, all right, so instead of saying worst, we'll say unfortunate gimmicks. Uh, give me an unfortunate gimmick. Well, there are a lot. Um, I think that one of the most 
unfortunate gimmicks that I have ever come across. Probably ever, ever, ever. ever. like ever, ever. Okay. Um, and maybe it's just because I'm not into this band all that much. Um, would be the Kiss Demon. Oh my. <laughs> um, if you are a WCW diehard, or if you're just a fan of really terrible, terrible gimmicks, um, or unfortunate, sorry, uh, Dale, Dale Torborg, um, <laughs> the Kiss Demon came out in complete Kiss makeup, had a guitar in the works, and wrestled. And somehow WCW thought that was going to be a blockbuster of a gimmick. Um, yeah. Uh, it, nope. it fell on deaf ears, pun intended. You know, when he came out, I honestly thought he was somebody else. I thought he was like, I thought he was Crush, or I uh, oh, couldn't think of. I, I think it was just Crush. I, I thought they were like re, you know, re came up with a, another gimmick for him, but it wasn't right. It was this guy. You said yeah, Dale Torborg. I I could have swore it was like Crush under that uh, makeup, and it kind of looked like him. But yeah, it's obviously not. But and, and what makes it? unfortunate like we're saying is i'm sure the guy is great uh, a lot of people say really nice things about him uh edge and um lots of lots of former wrestlers but um it's just anytime that you do that like and it's not kiss you're gonna have people that are like well what like they're not even there yeah. why i mean why kiss first of all all right i mean granted <sighs> They got some good songs. Okay, we got that point. But, I mean, Kiss really sells themselves out. I think they have a Kiss casket you could buy when you die. They have Kiss toilets, uh, Kiss anything. So they really they, they really put their name on anything and everything. So I think having a wrestler is just, you know, part of their uh, uh, part of their everyday life. It's, it's interesting that you say that because every time I listen to Kiss, I want to puke in a toilet and die in a casket. So... <laughs> That's um. That's pretty much what I think of Kiss. That's your. That's a. Uh, so, what's making this an unfortunate gimmick? I mean, just because it was too Gene Simmons esque in a ring, or I mean, it was. It just didn't go. Yeah, I just think that when wrong place, wrong time. Yeah, but like, if you're thinking of wrestling, yeah, music goes with wrestling. Obviously, they have entrance themes and and whatnot. But why? Why Kiss? Like uh, today, we're gonna have. A Nirvana gimmick, okay, <laughs> and um, he's gonna come out with long grungy hair, and yeah. he's gonna be uh, have a bad attitude and kind of brooding, and he's gonna be called um, Kurt Disaxel <laughs> Cobain. No, I don't know, but um, yeah, I just don't think that that really lends itself very well to the wrestling industry. So, sorry, Kiss Demon, that was very unfortunate for you. Yeah, definitely. I, I see where you're going. I mean, uh, maybe if it was the 70s, it would have probably been cool. And, uh, the 70s. <laughs> what, what, Jonathan? The 70s. The 70s. Yeah, well, hey, hey, it's it, 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 wrong place, wrong time, but <laughs> there's a lot of <laughs> unfortunate gimmicks, and we, uh, we have a lot more to talk about, Jonathan. Um, Another unfortunate gimmick. I think one of the biggest ones everybody keeps talking about to this day, more than probably they, they ever should. Uh, hopefully we'll have him on uh, the show soon, but the Shockmaster. As uh, dirty as it sounds, it's really not that dirty. The Shockmaster. Um, I mean, they, they, took, they took Typhoon. They took Tugboat. They made him, well, this was before all that. Um, they, somebody had a good idea. Somebody thought they had a great idea by taking a Stormtrooper helmet <laughs> throwing some glitter on it um and you know uh, i don't even know how this got past anybody's uh, creative plans or ideas being like yeah well, let's do it um but he i don't know it, it it didn't last um but to this day i think uh you know he he still goes to conventions with that helmet and i can't wait to get a picture with it anyway but still one of the most unfortunate gimmicks i think is the Shockmaster. would you agree on that I would, and as a matter of fact, we have somebody that would like to talk about this in studio right now. Uh-oh. So you're the man that rules the world. Well, I mean, no, I'm just like a podcaster, <laughs> but, um... You've ruled the world long enough, Sid Vicious. Well, who, who is this? <laughs> they call me the Shockmaster. Oh my god, the Shockmaster is here with us in studio. Um, <laughs> I can't believe this right now. Um, do you have anything else you want to... You, you want a piece of me? Whoa, easy. Hey, man, uh, it was just a question, just huh, buddy? A, I mean, calm down. All right, let's... Let, okay, Shockmaster, you're well, done. All for right. everybody listening, he really wasn't here. We, uh, we fooled you. Yes, that was... He wasn't really here. <laughs> um, no, but I think what makes this gimmick so unfortunate is... 
not even the fact that he was wearing a glittered stormtrooper helmet. I think it's the fact that he fell. And, um, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that it would have went to the top of the charts had he not fallen, but... That, that was his debut, though, right? Yeah, that, that was, was his freaking debut of... Uh, I, we'll have to ask him about this personally, but, I mean, I mean, I guess it, <laughs> the bad karma, you know what I mean? Like, that had to tell you how long the gimmick was going to go on, or... Yeah. I mean, give him credit, though. The man stood right up and still went on with it, so... <laughs> yeah. It wasn't like, eh, hey, just cut to commercial. He it, still went with it. It's crazy, because they said that throughout the day, they were, you know, working on the thing, and... um he walked right through the wall and no problem or whatever. And then at the end of it, someone decided to put a piece of wood at the uh. bottom of the um, the wall. And so that's why he tripped because he was used to not. Uh, it's very unfortunate <laughs> for him. Um, I wonder if it was a rib from somebody. You know, I wonder if somebody was like, you know, fuck this guy. I hate him. Or, you know, <laughs> you know, or. or there's something to where it's like, let me just, I know what they're going to do. Let me just stick this over here and see if you can get through it. But it, it, it probably wasn't, but it, maybe it's just fun to think that, I guess. I yeah. I, I mean, and you know, he's had so many different gimmicks. He was big man steel. He was typhoon. He was tugboat. He was the shock master. I mean, he, he's really kind of lasted for quite a while with just, you know, kind of unfortunate gimmicks, but he owned every one of them. And that's once again, the unfortunate part of this is, He's a great guy, but he just got saddled with some some bad bad gimmicks. Yeah, definitely. Um, would you say that that was funny what I just what I just talked about? Uh, it was unfortunate. But you don't think it was funny, like funny ha ha, or funny like funny ha ha, like maybe it was humorous oh i see what you did there hugh morris hugh morris uh i give him a lot of credit though of today but back then i mean uh, i guess they could have did something a little bit different but uh yeah i mean this guy has now made his way into you know the training facility of wwe we're talking about bill demont um in wcw he was part of a group called the misfits in action but prior to that he was simply known as Hugh Morris, and he would come out and laugh hysterically and then just, like, stop. So he was kind of like a, a heel, but his name was Hugh Morris. So I, I don't know what's more unfortunate than that. It's like a sad clown. It's like, you know, it's like when Doink the Clown was uh, evil Doink. It's very unfortunate for Bill DeMott. Yeah. Uh, and granted, I mean, he's a talented guy, a talented wrestler. No, no, no. Not taking that away from him. It's just, I guess, you know, the the, the unfortunate gimmick uh, that he was given. Um, I, I guess back then, honestly, he didn't really bother me too much. Um, maybe I just didn't watch too much of him. But, I mean, I was like, eh, it's, I get it. It's it's, it's funny. Um, but, yeah, when you look back on it, it was really, you know, probably not one of the best things I guess you could give him. So it was not humorous. <laughs> it was not what humorous. Saying. Okay. There you go. A little, you got to love Jonathan with his little segues here. Uh, speaking of segue... I, that's not really a good segue. That's a says. term that we use in the business. <laughs> in the biz. Uh, our biz. So uh, whatever. Segue. Uh, let's talk about somebody else. Um, Beaver Cleavage. Yes. Uh, a lot of you might remember Beaver Cleavage as being one half of the Headbangers. Yes. Uh, um, and he had a few gimmicks in between too. But I mean, one of the, the worst things they could have possibly have given him was Beaver Cleavage. Yeah, it was a take on the show Leave It to Beaver, but it was during the Attitude Era, so, um, you know, puns and innuendos intended. He was Beaver Cleavage, and um, they even had, like, a highly sexualized mother figure for him, so it was a very strange thing. He was in the Headbangers. He was also Chaz. Um, he was also in the group... With D'Lo Brown, they were called Lowdown, and they were a tag team. He was, um, you know, a good wrestler and everything, but it was so st stupid. I think the vignettes were very funny. They were kind of, you know, out there, but um, I don't know, like we've stated in the past, who comes up with this and says, I've got a great idea. <laughs> we're going to go back to the 1950s, <laughs> which is not the audience that we're, we're trying to appeal to, but we're going to go back to the 1950s. We're going to spoof a show called Leave it to Beaver, I mean, it would have been more funny or funnier if it was like something from Full House or, you know, something more relevant, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, uh, Charles Warrington, uh, who was Mosh in yes. the Headbangers, uh, who was also Beaver Cleavage, uh, you know, he had a few other gimmicks in between there. Um, 
You know, he was the mother smucker, <laughs> spider number one, just reading some of the, his ring names he's had. But, uh, I mean, I think they gave Beaver cleavage without going into <laughs> to, to so much history of it. Um, you know, as part of as the attitude error, they were trying to do different racy, spicy things. And, I mean, I guess that was one of the ideas they just threw out there to see if it stuck. And uh, it you know, did not. Yeah, it did not. So, uh, because I think what happened was, uh, I think I believe uh, after Thrasher suffered a knee injury, they uh, you know they broke away from the headbanger, so they tried to give him something else because he's a talented wrestler. He's still he was still a good worker, um, but you know it was one of those things that they just had to repackage him into something else. And I mean, I don't know. You know, it, it, he had a voluptuous Mrs. Cleavage, yes, and the two would exchange sexual in- innuendos and uh, in your endo, yeah, in, your, in what endo? Uh, but, you know, I guess it was one of those things that they really just tried to be racy and whatnot, and, it, you know, didn't really come across as marketable. Yeah, no, and like we said, I just think that with this, with the Kiss Demon, you just get a lot of things that are out of touch with the people who are actually watching your product. So, yeah. you know, they're always reaching for that 18 to 35 male demographic, and what 18 to 35 year old male in the attitude area was watching Leave It to Beaver? I just I, know, I don't yeah. get it. So yeah, it's one of those things where they uh, yeah I don't know who knows, but it's just one of those things where they're somebody thought they had a good idea, and that person who thought they had a good idea probably grew up during the Leave It to Beaver days and was like, hey, well, I still remember it. Yeah, be funny. I, I think, sure, <laughs> sure. I guess. Yeah, I, I think that one of the biggest ones, uh, quite li- literally and figuratively. Um, one of the most unfortunate gimmicks um, had to have been by the gentleman named Mike Shaw. Um, for those of you who don't know who I'm talking about, I'm talking about the gentleman who would later become Bastion Booger. <laughs> um, do you remember much of Bastion Booger when he was in the WWF? I just remember him as one big fat booger. I don't know. He just he was a big guy, pretty much. <laughs> he kind of reminds me of what Brodus Clay's dad would have looked like. That's what I. That's oh, well, you know. That's what I. That's what I see. Is if you want to make me think of something. What's crazy about Mike Shaw and uh, heck of a guy. He's passed away, but um, he was a great guy. Is that he had? He's one of those people that in WCW had a pretty big um, and good gimmick with being Norman the Lunatic, and then later. Norman the Maniac, but he um he got a lot of good matches out of people. He he wrestled with um Mick Foley. I know he's got a lot of good things to say about him, but um once he jumped to WWE, he that's where the the problem started for him. Um and Credo, I'm you know I don't know everything, and I know that sometimes I may surprise you with certain <laughs> things or whatever, but. Um, when he first got into WWF, he was Friar Ferguson, ah. and he was like a, a a mean or a bad monk. Um, and I think that WWF at the time got a lot of bad press from that, and so they dropped the character. Yeah. So what does Vince say? <laughs> You're gonna go from a monk to somebody who's just horribly obese. Yeah, and you're gonna like pick your nose. You're gonna like have food coming out of your mouth, and that's pretty much what you're gonna be. Um, he, I'm st- I'm staring right now at a photo of him as Bastion Booger, and I'm like, his outfit is so horrible, man. It it, it, it reminds me of uh, the Fifth Element, where the girl, uh, the Fifth Element, yeah. she her dress was just like straps, you know, it was like covering her boobs, covering her waistline, yes. covering the covering the special parts, right? Yes. Oh, it, it totally reminds special me. Special parts trending worldwide. <laughs> special parts. Uh, it, it, he looks like he's wearing like three seatbelts that are just crossing his body, um, and the uh, these freaking big fat guys have like the tightest outfits on as possible. I don't even know. I don't even think he even took it off in his in, in his in his entire time. I think he just wore it over underneath everything because like once they put this on him, I don't think you could ever get it off him. It was probably the one un, one of the most unflattering things you could ever put this guy in. And granted, he's a big guy, okay, whatever. But I mean, you could have put him in something else. I mean, it, it, the costume design of his outfit, let alone just made his gimmick one be one of the most unfortunate gimmicks i guess yeah um now i want to i want to talk to you real quick about some um some unfortunate gimmicks that surrounded professions maybe okay um 
So during the 90s, the WWF was really kind of grasping at straws. WCW had started, and um, there wasn't a huge war yet, but WWF was kind of hokey, yeah. if, I, if I can use that term. Sure. Um, so there were a lot of professions in the WWF at the time. Can you think of some of them that were possibly unfortunate? Ooh. Um, to- yeah, I think uh, nowadays it's funny because if you look at WWE today, it's pretty much all these characters are from different countries. You know what I mean? They're from their gimmicks pretty much are their country. But back then, yeah, it was pretty much professions. And I think one of the biggest things I could think of uh, were the two that really stand out at the top of my head are uh, Duke the Dumpster mm-hmm. and Isaac Yankum, a mm-hmm. dentist and a garbage man. Uh, now, granted, don't get me wrong. Duke the Dumpster, I think, was pretty awesome. Uh, he didn't. I don't know. The, the The gimmick was cool, but it, like, again, you know, like, how much can you do with a with a being a garbage man back then? Um, and it's now, especially a dentist. Uh, you know, do you see the WWE champion or the WWF champion back then being Isaac Yankum, the dentist champion of the WWE or F? I just said it twice, but. I think that what we're talking about is not only was that unfortunate, but it was also unfortunate for a dentist to have bad teeth. <laughs> hey, it's kind of one of those... Uh... It would be almost like, uh, if I can pair it with Duke the Dumpster, it would be a garbage man who didn't pick up trash. <laughs> because a dentist with bad teeth is pretty much the same thing as a garbage man who doesn't pick up trash. Yeah, you think they would have gave him like these bleach white teeth you know like you look at them like some of these people on tv where they just bleach their teeth like super white that would have been made more sense for him but yeah but then again i could kind of see like uh, he has bad teeth but yeah yeah it's it's unfortunate because like a lot of these guys man back then it was just gimmick central and it was just like oh you could be a doctor you could be a, a dentist you could be a garbage man you can be you know a police officer and so on etc it was just it was just you know job central of uh take your job make it a gimmick yeah um I think that some of the ones that we'll just kind of brief, br- briefly, sorry, go through some of these. Um, you know, this wasn't a profession, needless to say, but the Repo Man, yeah, um, Barry Darso, who was in Demolition and had a, a no- another list of just horrid characters that he did. Um, well, it's funny. Uh, there's actually a TV show called Repo Men now, and they actually. They film them repossessing people's stuff. But anyway, yeah. Gimmick infringement. <laughs> um, the Repo Man was, I thought it was very entertaining. Um, I think that his ring gear is probably my favorite almost of all time. <laughs> he had like a little Zorro mask on and then like a trench coat that had tire tracks on it. Like he had been run over. <laughs> the one that doesn't make sense. Uh, yeah. It's, <laughs> he carried like a rope with him to like repossess things. <laughs> but like it was usually cars and stuff. So I don't know if he was like pulling the car with the rope. <laughs> he reminded me of like the Hamburglar from yes. McDonald's. Like that's rubble, like rubble, the- rubble, 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 <laughs> rubble. That's what, that's what his gimmick reminded me of. He reminded me of being like the Hamburglar guy of, uh, of, the, of the WWE. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's another. This podcast is brought to you by McDonald's. <laughs> Where, uh, yeah, I don't know. But yeah, even okay. So we even talked about policemen, the big boss man. Okay, yes. Uh, but hey, what's 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 good to have a policeman without a convict? Absolutely, I and know what, where you're going with this. <laughs> nails, nails, Mister uh, didn't last too long after uh, holding up Vince for money, but still, nails. He had also one of those voice changer gimmicks where they, you know, did something with his voice in post production, um, and just made him sound totally different than what he sh- would be sounding like, and. Uh, I don't know how there's you can't really go too far in the WWE or WWF back then being a convict, I guess. I mean, I don't know. No, I mean, you had nails and the main thing I remember about nails is every time that he was talking, he was just spitting like it was everywhere. Just spittle everywhere, if I can use that term. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I guess the biggest thing to say in the WWF at the time of the 90s is that if you just really wanted to be anything that, you know, if you put your heart to it and your mind that you could be anything you want, namely a Canadian police officer named the Mountie. Oh no. And, um, if you remember anything about the Mountie other than the taser, you will remember this. Uh Oh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's not a Jimmy Hart classic. Yeah, I'm not for sure who came up with that, but um, 
I'm the Mountie. I'm brave. I'm handsome. I'm strong. I'm the Mountie, and I uphold the law. So um, it's kind of like they took Shawn Michaels' theme and uh, twisted it up a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. You think I'm cool? You know, I'm sexy, but I'm the Mountie. I'm a cop. And yeah, yeah, whatever. I don't know. So let's <laughs> let's kind of um, we've we've spoke about a segue yeah. um, in the past, and for those of you. <laughs> You know, the the more you know, this is what a segue is. Um, we're going to be speaking with Winter in a little bit. So, do you remember, do you know where I'm going with this? I think I, I, think I do, and I think we're, we're going to bring some family issues up yes. about it. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, feel free. Segue. So, Paul Burchell, the Ripper at the time, was, I thought, a great wrestler. Um, he's one of those people that I would kind of put in Cesaro's category where... You can look at the person right away and tell that he's athletic and he's, you know, a pretty good wrestler. Um, but they didn't really know what to do with him. And this was prior to him being a pirate. So they said, you know what, we're going to, he's from England. So let's pair Katie Lee, who has an accent and um, can, you know, this, this will, this will work. So they never really introduced who she was, just Katie yeah. Lee, virtual. And then all of a sudden, they start to seem like they're kind of together. Yeah. But you don't know if they're a couple or what. And then it comes out that what, Credo? Uh, they're brother and sister. I I want to bring the crickets back because <laughs> I just don't. Once again, like, and this isn't the first time that this has happened. I've listened to a uh, actually, if you've watched the WWE DVD about Vince McMahon. There's extras where he talks about how Stephanie and Shane, like, he wanted to do an incest angle with them. Like, (laughs) so I guess if he feels that it's not off limits for him, it shouldn't be off limits for just two performers. But once again, where do you go from that? You're, you I mean, hey, I'm uh, Paul Birchall (laughs) and I'm Katie Lee and we're brother and sister. And what, what, what gain from that? I mean, it's not like it's a belt. It's not like it's a new cool thing. It's, Hey, we're brother and sister. Yeah, and uh, you can't kiss your sister like that, and uh, or you know. Yeah, this isn't Joe Dirt. Or this is <laughs> you know. It was one of those things, I guess. Like I said, you know, they they threw it out there. Hey, how can we be different and be you know? Uh, this is live raw. This is you know, I'll be got you kind of thing. And uh, yeah, I, it's what it's it's another unfortunate uh, gimmick, I guess, that they were given because they're both a talented. They're both talented wrestlers, no doubt about it. Uh, it's just, it's one of those things, man, where they come in and it's like, oh, we got to give you something. And you just can't come in these days and be in a talented wrestler. You got to come in with this gimmick that gets over. And unfortunately, you're not going to get over where you're sleeping with your sister. Yeah, I guess that I would like to know the ratio of unfortunate gimmicks to great gimmicks. So, you know, out of all the wrestlers there's sure. ever been in the world, maybe there's. 10,000 gimmicks and out of those 10,000 300 of them stuck so um you know but i think it depends on the person katie lee went on to some success paul virtual as well and actually i just read an interview where paul virtual is a firefighter now well, and he's go. training to be like a nurse as well so um kudos to him and that's awesome yeah that's it and like uh when we talk about these guys we're not talking about them personally guys when you're listening out there obviously you know we're not talking about the person who plays them we're just talking about some of the they gimmicks they were given things about mantor <laughs> we yeah we even get to mantor I and uh, mantor. we even get to a lot of these other unfortunate gimmicks but uh I mean, when you think about it, I guess the time is different now, but uh there's a lot of miss or a lot of unfortunate gimmicks today, Jonathan. Let's really quick, off the top of your head, what's one gimmick right now that you think goes in this category of unfortunate gimmicks? Give me one person right now. I'm going to go with Rowan. I'm going to say that Eric Rowan is a very unfortunate gimmick because he was great when he was in the Wyatt family, and I knew this was going to happen. I knew it. I, I bet you $1 that this was going to happen. They break him up from the Wyatt family. They give him a Rubik's Cube. Now he's a genius. <laughs> And a wine drinker, apparently, they said. Uh, and, and it's just like, really? I mean, he's a big monster. Exactly. They don't have to do anything with him except have him go out and destroy people. That's it. And that's it. I mean, Harper is great, and he's doing just that. But they started to do some weird stuff with Rowan, and I feel that that's very unfortunate for him because he started at the top, and now he's just going into the dredges. It's just... Yeah, and uh, I'll bring up one uh, one person too uh is it's the tag team of the los matadores yeah 
uh, there was nothing wrong with the clones. They have that big name, that family name. Uh, Rosa Mendez was awesome with them. I mean, the, nothing wrong. It was it was one of those wrong place, wrong times. Maybe I mean, the Usos survived it. Uh, the clones didn't, um, and now they're repackaged as Los Matadores. They're not even uh, from Spain, you know. They're Puerto Rican, <laughs> the, the, you know. It's like, stop! Like, who's like, stop? You know what I mean? Like, why are you doing this? This isn't Saturday morning cartoons. Uh, if you still had a Saturday morning show when they were on it, I get it, but you don't. So stop it. Um, I feel bad for them because they're another talented team. You know, it's not like they they suck or anything, and they, they can't do anything. Uh, they're talented wrestlers. Given stu- they look like human Ninja Turtles to me. You know, their headbands they look like freaking Ninja Turtles. Yeah. Um, and it's I don't know. Maybe if they lost the headbands, I'd like them. I, I'd the, be okay with them. And but, the bull. And the, don't even get me started with the bull. I don't want to talk about the bull. It's but bull crap. That's what yeah. it is. <laughs> uh, it's it's these things. It, it almost feels like the '90s are coming back sometimes like slowly in a little bit to where all these unfortunate gimmicks are coming back nowadays and it's like gimmicks are fun don't get me wrong but sometimes when you're doing silly too silly of a gimmick it's just not working and it's just like come on like they could have made them bullfighters or whatever that's fine but lose the mask lose the bull and just come out like that you know what i mean like i don't know i think they try too hard sometimes and when they try too hard that's what we get absolutely and you know there's there's always room for jello i guess <laughs> there's there's always room for some disbelief um some i forget what it's called the suspension, suspension of, dis- of of suspension of belief this what is it suspension of disbelief suspension of well, as you can see, all we know about is wrestling. So we yeah, don't really <laughs> I mean, I, there's nothing wrong with getting in there and being able to say, you know, that doesn't look right, but like I'm watching wrestling, so it's no big deal. Yeah. Um, but I think whenever we get the bullfighters and start getting some crazy stuff like that, it's time to pump the brakes a little bit. And I, I, now, as before we go to, I mean, we could go on and on about this, but one last one last question for you, Jonathan. Uh, Vaud villains. Yes. I wouldn't consider them a, an unfortunate gimmick. I mean, I think what they're doing is different. It's funny. It's entertaining. But how long do you see them lasting or do you see them evolving into anything else? I mean, because I think some people, you know, they might not have that many fans. But I think I'm, I love the gimmick. I love the vaudevillain thing. Um, and it doesn't bother me. But I'm saying, like, how long do you think this would last? Or will this just be, you know, the comedy side of... Uh of some of the stuff that we see, I guess. I don't know. You know, I also, I, I'm big fans of them. I think they're both great. Um, I, you know, it's, it's, it is unfortunate in the sense that in NXT right now, there's a lot of people that get it. It's a, it's a cool studio audience. It's the people that kind of are hip, um, hipster esque, maybe that are rooting for them. I also think they're great, but I think whenever it, it comes to WWE, you've got a lot of kids, and they're not really going to know how to correlate that. Yeah. Um, but I love the sepia tone. I love yeah. their, their music. I love everything about them. Yeah, it's just like uh, I talked about Los Matadores. Uh, it, it's just not working for me. Yeah. But when I see Vaud Villains, I get that it's supposed to be silly like that. To where, But, the, what, you know, their promos are funny. The way they present themselves is unique. It's different. Um, and I love it. And I, but, like, but when I think about the long run, I mean... Do you think that they're just going to be like a laughing stock when they make it on the like Raw, for example, or are they or are they going to have to like tweak them big time, or I don't know. It's the same thing, I guess, with the Ascension right now because the Ascension is is somewhat of a gothic or um, Ministry of Darkness type situation where once they get brought up to the main roster, right now you have the Usos, you have Golden Stardust, which are brothers, you have um, the Mizdow and and the Miz, you have. Um, these these tag team, I guess, well, Adam Rose and the Bunny, but you have these tag teams that are like brothers or you know whatever you want to say, and you're bringing the Ascension in, which adds a different dose of non-reality. Yeah. And so I think that that's going to... NXT make stars, they come to WWE, and then they're going to have to figure out what to do with them there. And yep. I don't know that the VOD villains and Ascension are going to survive, but... I do, I do like um, the VOD villains a lot. Awesome. Well, guys, we talked a lot about unfortunate gimmicks. So we, we said at the beginning worst gimmicks, but uh, they're mostly unfortunate gimmicks. I mean, guys that were handed a lot of these gimmicks that just didn't make it, or we don't know why on earth anybody said, yes, let's do it. 
But that's, I guess that's the business, right, Jonathan? That's what happens when they uh, give them these uh, characters to play and portray. Yes, they give them the business, as they say. <laughs> that's it, guys. Uh, so anyway, uh, to continue on, we have none other than uh, CEO of FWE, Jordan Schneider, coming up. And then we also have Winter, who will be joining us shortly. Brr. That's right, Jonathan. It's almost winter, and she's almost here. Get it. <laughs> All right, joining me right now is the president and CEO of FWE Wrestling in New York City, Jordan Schneider. Jordan, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Now, uh, Jordan, uh, we we recently partnered up with you to be, you know, the media to your wrestling, if you will. Uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, I'll tell the fans out there for FWE listening, maybe what they could expect from FWE and uh, another wrestling podcast. Well, I think, you know, working with you guys is going to be great for the FWE fans on so many levels. But the obvious is they'll get better backstage access to everything going on at the shows. They'll get access to the talent in between the shows with the exclusive interviews, podcasts, and things like this that we're doing right now, plus giveaways, prizes, and all sorts of stuff we probably haven't even thought of yet. Awesome. Yeah, we can't wait. We're excited. Uh, we, we have a, You guys got a lot of go- good shows coming up, too. Maybe we can talk briefly about what you have in store for the fans in the new, in the new year, because uh, you guys are heading over to uh, No Limits in 2015. We're going to start off down in, uh, down in the city. Tell us a little about, about No Limits and why it's so special, because uh, we're going to be at a casino this time, right? Yeah, uh, No Limits 2015 is actually our third No Limits. The first one was back in 2012. Um, it was where we first crowned our women's champion, Maria, won the, the one-night four-woman tournament. And then at No Limits 2013, we had that amazing TLC match with Tommy Dreamer, Matt Hardy, and Carlito. 2014, we didn't do a No Limits, so I'm very excited to bring No Limits back. And this time, like you said, having it in the casino, it's just going to give it a bigger feel. It's a bigger venue. Everything's going to be bigger. You know, the production, everything. Sure. And now, you guys are doing a lot this year. Is this the first time you're kind of branching out from New York City, if you will? I mean, you're headed up to Bridgewater next on April 16th and 17th for two nights of uh, Battle of Bridgewater up there. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, too? And uh, is this your first venture up, uh, up upstate New York? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely hitting upstate New York in April, like you said, but we're also doing California in March. That's right. Which is going to be... You know, I mean, that's going to be amazing. That's our first time on the West Coast, and uh, I'm super excited for that one. And you had our heavyweight champion, John Hennigan, on, and he dropped the bomb that he's wrestling AJ Styles for the first time ever. So, you know, New York is obviously our home, but like you said, it is time to branch out and expand and take the show on the road and, and show fans in other markets what SWE is all about. That's great. And how do you feel now as, like, the president and, uh, you know, in charge of the company to where you guys could start branching out now. It, does it make you excited, nervous, or I don't know, how does it feel for you being able to go to, to California one night and then a few weeks later go up to upstate New York, you know, just to sort of spread out from New York City, if you will? Um, I mean, it's definitely a little nerve-inducing because you obviously want to make sure that, that the show lives up to the FWE standards and that everything goes according to plan, be it the lighting, the staging, the talent, and little things like that. So it'll make coordinating, you know, all that much more difficult. But I think we have a really good group of guys and, you know, awesome staff, and, and we'll be able to pull this together. And, you know, if if it doesn't work, then we'll, we'll try somewhere else. You know, I mean, there's sure. tons of places to run shows, and the first time you go anywhere, it's always, you know, a tough outing, and the second time is usually better. So I know... You know, like, for instance, you mentioned Two Nights in Bridgewater, plus we have Rochester coming up. That'll be our 20th show, and, you know, SWE in Hollywood. So if we, assuming everything goes as planned, you know, that's five shows, I think, in 10 weeks, and then we have stuff we haven't even announced in other cities, states, towns that we're working on for the end of the year. So it's it's just time, you know, to to really give it the old college try, and and I didn't want to just sit still and be content running in you know one area sure. so it you know it, you got to kind of just grow and otherwise you just you know i, I don't know it, it was time 
Sure. It is definitely time to give it a shot. Sure. And now, for all, for all the new fans listening, maybe some people who aren't familiar with FWE in the city, they could be listening to you guys from wherever right now. Uh, maybe, can we give a little bit about, a brief history about you, maybe? How did you guys come up with FWE, or how did you guys get started? How did it all come about? Um, in a brief uh, explanation, if you will. I mean, uh, maybe there's a long two-hour story we could do a documentary about, but uh, I don't know, maybe just letting the fans know who, who, who are listening now that, you know, have never probably never heard of FWE that, you know, aren't from around uh, New York City or whatnot. Sure. I mean, you know, I actually started as a wrestler, which a lot of the FWE fans, you know, the original FWE fans know because I've worked a few of the FWE shows. Um but, you know, we, we were like anyone else on the independent circuit. We were traveling to Pittsburgh and going all over wherever we could to get booked and do shows in Ohio, West Virginia, Philadelphia. And there were little things where it was like, okay, that was a really good show, but, you know, the curtain was really bad. Or there was no lighting, and, you know, why didn't they record it? And, and the sound system wasn't so good. And we started talking and saying, well, we could do that. And, and well, what if we did this? And we know, you know, these people... and they're really talented and underutilized. Maybe we give them the stage. Mm-hmm. And it just kind of snowballed into what it's become today. Nice. Um, and now, you said you already had big plans for this year. Uh, you know, this is pretty much, I would say, the first time you guys are kind of branching out to other states and other territories, if you will, uh, you know, bringing the show on the road. This is, I mean, the first time in 2015? Yep, definitely. I mean, we've done, you know, we did Long Island for FWEX. That was our TED show. We've done Queens. We've done Manhattan. We've done Brooklyn. But we've never left that area. So this is, you know, exciting times for everyone here at FWE. Sure. And now I want to talk a little bit about your website, too, because I think you are one of the, the few promotions that actually offer, you know, like video on demand. Uh, you, you guys, I, I, I give you uh, the kudos because you're actually up with the times. Uh, you're not, you know, people aren't just buying your videos online or whatnot. You can actually watch it live, stream it, uh, and pay for it on your site. Um, how, tell me about, you know, how is it? competing with other companies to where, you know, you try to be update and on top of things like this, because I mean, t- in today's, today's market, you know, people want to watch eye pay-per-views compared to, you know, waiting for the DVD to come out. We're in like the now generation where we want it now, now, now. Uh, I mean, was this, how did this come about to being like, Hey, we need these videos live, uh, streaming and, uh, now, you know what I mean? Cause not too many companies are doing it yet. They're still selling the DVDs on their site and not too many people are offering what you guys offer. Can you tell me how that, you know, is uh, helping you guys out as a company, too? Yeah, we've actually had video on demand since our very first year. So, like, our very first show, we had an iPhone app before the show even happened. We had an iPhone, Android, BlackBerry app. And we knew from day one that that was going to be something that was important to us. And we put the whole first show in the app for free. And then I think it took us probably about six months to get the video on demand thing built. And we built it from the ground up. I mean, we hired you know, people to build it the way we wanted it. So it was integrated with our systems and we used tokens to watch matches and there are free matches and matches for five tokens. And, you know, you could buy the whole show for 50 tokens or whatever it is. But, I mean, video on demand has been great for us because you can, like you said, instantly access that content. And let's say someone missed the pay-per-view last night, well, it's up on our site 24 hours later. Or if they just weren't sure, oh, I don't know, maybe it's going to be good, maybe it won't. You know, and then they hear about it, and they're like, "Okay, I, I got to see this." They can instantly. So, what you're trying to tell me is that you guys had a network before WWE. We were given Blu-ray pretty much before WWE <laughs> was. They did. I mean, they did a couple shows a year, like WrestleMania and SummerSlam and things like that. Yeah. But every single show we've done has been on Blu-ray. <laughs> as far as I know, we were the first indie company to do it. Uh, I saw a few others later claiming, eh. oh, we're, we're the first on Blu-ray, but we already had a year worth of Blu-ray title now. So I got the proof to back that up. <laughs> now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the championships in your company, too, because uh, I think you're also one of the first companies that I know, at least. I don't know anybody else who's doing this, at least on the East Coast, that you guys... The first. The, the replica titles? Like, you guys already have replica titles well, for sale. Well, you know, what's funny is, I don't know if it's accidental or if they're just watching us. But we have a little friendly rivalry with Ring of Honor, and we are actually further along in the social media race than them. We're the number three behind WWE TNA. And then we announced all our replica titles, put them out, and then a few weeks later, Ring of Honor started to do theirs. I don't know if they're available yet, but another case of us being first. So, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just little things like that. I know it's, it's just a small victory, I guess. 
Sure. Uh, I mean, that's great, too, because I think, you know, the whole, if you will, social media verse, you know, has exploded the last few years. And, uh, you know, uh, f- five years ago, if you were telling people you're going to send out a tweet about something, they had no idea what you were doing. Now that's like the only way people communicate uh, with their fans and whatnot, with the superstars. I mean, how has, you know, social media pretty much revolutionized what you guys do, do you think? Um, if it weren't for social media, we wouldn't be where we are. And that's, you know, the truth. Because day one, when I realized, uh-oh, we need a commentator, how, how do we get one? Well, I guess this Michael Chavello guy, he's pretty awesome. Maybe we could send him a tweet. And he responded with an email contact. And we literally probably had four Twitter followers. We were still the egg profile picture. And he responded. And um, we got his info. Got him aboard. You know, we got Winter originally through Twitter. So little things like that, I mean, it, it, it definitely helped. Having Michael Chavello legitimized us from day one, in my opinion, because if, if you're a fan of MMA or soccer or boxing or any sport that you've heard this man call, mm-hmm. he brings such a different element to it, and he just, he, I mean, he makes it so exciting. Like, if you watch FWE Back to Brooklyn, we have that six-man tag with uh, London, Kendrick, and Lethal versus the Young Bucks and Petey Williams. Yep. Like, watching that match, hearing Chavello call it, it just, I mean, it, it literally still to this day gives me goosebumps. It's just probably one of the most amazing moments in our company to see. Yeah, I, uh, I say today, too, with what I see on TV, is that, you know, you need you need the play-by-play guys as much as you need the guys in the ring. And, you know, without them or the guys calling it, you know, it's like you might as well just, you know, play music or something during it because, you, I don't know, it adds that element. I've, you know, I've listened to all the shows. I've seen all the shows for FWE, and he, you know, the commentary is that third man, if you will, uh, that adds to the show. Um, yeah, now, I mean... So imagine Mick Foley getting thrown off the cell and JR just sitting there, you know, crickets. Like, it wouldn't be the same. That moment is immortalized, you know, in part by Foley's insanity and in part by JR's call. So moments like that can definitely make or break something important. Sure. And now, I always try to ask people, you know, like, hey, were you a fan before you did this and stuff when I talked to wrestlers? But for you, I mean, growing up, obviously, I'm going to guess that you were obviously a pro wrestling fan. But how does it feel now to have your own company, to build it from, like, you know, the ground up? Uh, Is it, I mean, you know, is it like a different aspect to you? I mean, does it change your mood about pro wrestling or is it still that, you know, you love it as much as you did growing up? Um, in some ways, it's surreal, and everything's kind of come full circle. I forget what it was that Conrad and I were talking about the other day, but it's just it's weird to have people randomly recognize you, or if you're wearing an FWE shirt, they're like, "Oh, I was at the show, and it's you know it was really great," or this and that. But I I actually didn't get into wrestling until a little later. Probably I was like seven, eight years old, and I had just moved to Illinois, and someone a bunch of kids were talking about Raw and I clearly had no idea what they were talking about and this one kid pulled me aside and he was like you need to come over to my house today and I'm going to teach you everything there is to know about professional wrestling (laughs) that's great and that was it and then you know it just again like 10 years later started doing matches and things like that and and it is weird when like you get a text at, at midnight and it's John Morrison or Tommy Dreamer and and sometimes you know you know Tommy very well so you know, he says some weird stuff, and it, it, it's funny to go from here's a guy that I grew up watching, but I grew up idolizing, and now we're, you know, we're we're peers in a way. When he said to me after, I think it was the first FWE HOH double shot, or maybe the second one, and he sent me a text that said like, "I'm your Terry Funk," and that was that was a really cool moment. You know, obviously Terry Funk was so important to the original ECW, so. You know, little things like that. Sure. And now, how has uh, the growth of your company, has it surprised you? I mean, can you look back at yourself five years ago uh, and, you know, do you think you'd be here? Where You uh, you know, do you, has it come to a point to where it's like, wow, I can't believe that we're actually here now? Um, has it grown that much in the, in the recent years? Has it surprised you at all? I mean, I could lie and say this is exactly what I anticipated, you know, when we started. <laughs> sure. But I, in a way, it doesn't because... All the things that we saw that all these other companies weren't taking advantage of, where we knew we need to take advantage of this. We need to videotape. We need to have a cool set. We need to have nice lighting and make it an event, not just a show. You know, Sabotage wrestles for us. Mike, he's big on that. It's it's an event. It's not just a show. And when we do these huge three-hour pay-per-views, you know, with literally the biggest names in professional wrestling that are available to us, everyone from Bob Van Dam to Ted DiBiase Jr., who only works for us, 
literally only wrestled for us after leaving WWE. You know, I mean, that, that says something. When guys mm-hmm. seek you out and they say, this is the place I want to work, it, it's crazy. Like, it, I never wanted to just do shows and kind of just kind of run shows to run shows and, you know, draw your 200 fans. And it's cool and it's fun and it's great. But, like, there was always a bigger picture. And it was always about how to take it to the next level and how the steps that we need to take to get it there. That's what brought me to you guys, too. I mean, I'm a big media person, obviously. I work in the media industry. And seeing the kind of production that you guys put on, you know, I love it. You know what I mean? Like, you, you can go to any other indie show around the world, and it's just, you know... It, wherever, you know, uh, at, a, at a bingo hall, if you will, or a gym or whatever, and that's what it is. A lot of these guys don't care about the production value, and that's what I love about FWE, is that you guys care about the production value, you know, from the videos to social media. Uh, you get, you connect with the fans, and that's what it's all about, too. Uh, we spoke briefly, briefly that, you know, the commentators are that third man. You know, that production is that glue that holds it all together. You know, you have the wrestlers, uh, the ring, the commentators, then you get that production up there, and, it, you know, it makes it bigger. It, it's like going to a WWE event, but not a WWE event. You know what I mean? It's the, what sure. you guys give to the fans. I think that's what draws a lot of the fans in, is that, you know, you guys put on a great show, and you can't go wrong with any FWE show that you go to. It's funny you say that, because I actually have a couple old shows that I will not sell. We don't <laughs> sell them. We don't reproduce them. Great shows, but the production was kind of crappy, and the lighting wasn't right, and it just, you know, it doesn't put the product in the best light. So if you own one, it will eventually be very rare. But <laughs> we recently partnered with this guy. I don't know if you've heard of him, Steve Credo. He does I, some pretty awesome videos for us. So I, heard, I heard about I'm that. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. That's it. That's it. I mean, I, I, if I could be a wrestler right now, I probably would. But that ship sailed a long time ago, and I'm in a, I'm in a, di- I'm in a different world. You know, things are going on. I have a job, so it, you know, I can't do it, obviously. So to be in the wrestling world, I try to offer my services of video, photography, graphic design, all that stuff, to where hey, I can make this look better for you. Let me into that wrestling world. You know what I mean? So that's right. what I, that's what I love doing and helping out because obviously I can't wrestle. So that's <laughs> that's what we're trying to offer something else. Well, you to don't guys. know until you try. <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, it, it's tough because like if you look at our shows, we spend a thousand dollars on music alone. You're paying to write original music that when your wrestlers come out, it's special at your show with their music that they don't use anywhere else. You know, it's another thing that sets you apart. You're spending. Thousand plus dollars on lighting, staging, TV screens, all that stuff that realistically you don't need to spend money on, you know. And I think the fans probably wouldn't mind all that much, and for the most part, they wouldn't complain. But for me, I, I, it's really important that it looks professional, and it it really. I mean, like I said, we're we're not on TV. We've never been on TV. We're still you know four years old, basically. Yet, but you can yet. take some of the stuff that we've done and slap it right on TV, and I guarantee you the world would be shocked at what's out there. Exactly, and that's, I mean, that's what, if you guys are listening right now, head on over to FWWrestling.com, check out the videos, check out what's going on here, because, you know, it's New York City, it's the largest city in the world, come on, head on over there, check out all the stuff that FWE is doing, because you guys are missing out, but that's what, I mean, that's what another wrestling podcast, AWP, is, is teaming up with FWE because we want to be that media source for you guys. Uh, you know, being that outside media to help, well, how could I say it, uh, enhance what you guys are already doing. I mean, it, sure. you know what I mean? So it, it's like that it's part. the same way that there's a lot of not-so-good podcasts and <laughs> not-so-good media. That's right. Now we have really good podcasts and really good media that we get to work with, with you guys where we know everyone's going to get a good interview and it's not, you know, the same like, so what is it like in WWE? <laughs> like, why'd you leave? Exactly. Like, like, you know, it's like, come on, guys. I know. You know, let's, let's all be professional here and, and try to really look at this like a business. Like, you are like we are and you know, that's, that's why it, it makes sense that we're working together. Definitely. Now, what does the future look like for FWE? If you could, pr- I know we talked about the past. If you could maybe look into that, you know, crystal ball and look five years from now, is there anything you might think you'd see in the FWE's future or hope for? Or- I mean, if we do the same or better in the next five years as we did in the previous four years, you know, who knows? I mean, right now, the immediate future is Resorts World Casino, February 7th, and we got huge matches there. 
And then 311, Lure, Hollywood, and we got the ultimate of ultimate matches there, AJ Styles versus Sean Hennigan, two out of three falls. So, you know, I mean, there's, there's huge matches that we're going to announce for April. The future looks good for AWP and FWE working together. Uh, we're definitely going to have you on in the new year. Um, I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg for all the fans out there listening. I mean, we just wanted to get a little bit about uh, what you're doing, what's happening with FWE right now, and, uh, you know, the future of, future of wrestling for you guys. So I, I appreciate your time, and uh, thanks for, for, for joining us tonight. No, thanks so much for having me. And, you know, like you said, to the fans or people that may not be fans, but in the future hopefully will be fans, check out the website, fwwrestling.com, and listen to another wrestling podcast for exclusive match announcements and all sorts of dirt that I won't tell you, but they will. Awesome. All right, Jordan. Thanks so much, and we, we appreciate it. Sounds good, man. I'll see you in February. All right. Joining us tonight, we have uh, none other then Katerina Lee Waters. Katerina, thanks for joining us. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Yes, uh, let's get right in. Um, you wrestled for several companies in England before wrestling in America. Uh, mm-hmm. which, which style was harder to learn, and uh, is, was there a specific style that was your favorite? Well, I, I mean, are you asking me style in terms of whether British or American? Yeah. Right, well... Um, when I started in England, a lot of the promotions were using, you know, kind of the Americanized style. So that's pretty much what I learned. You know, the proper traditional old school English wrestling style with their specific sequences and stuff, I didn't really learn at the time. All right. So I have to say, I sort of went right back, right into, you know, what, what you guys or us here would do. Sure. Should we say, Yeah. Uh, well, now, when you came to America, what was uh, your ultimate goal when you started wrestling here? Was there any specific place you wanted to be? or? Well, I came to America signed with WWE. So that was pretty much, I guess, you know, that would be where I wanted to be and get better at sort of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, so, yeah. And then, I mean, TNA was another goal, you know, and mm-hmm. then I was lucky enough to go there as well. All right. Now, when That's you, quite fortunate. Yeah. Uh, when, when, you mm-hmm. fi- when you finally made it here, uh, were there some? What were some of the biggest uh, cultural obstacles? Maybe you had to deal with uh, coming from overseas. Mm, I don't know about having to deal with, but there was, you know, definitely a few interesting things. I guess the main difference one could say is everybody here has a car, and even if you live in a town, you know, sometimes you need a car to get from your house to the next supermarket Mm -hmm. you know rather than just being able to walk in Europe it's very much you know if it's close by you can walk there oh yeah yeah Uh, now uh, we understand you you moved from England to Louisville Kentucky Uh, Uh was was that like a big was was it a huge culture shock maybe for you or did anybody help you out along the way with that move oh well I mean everybody at OVW helped me a lot you know because everybody from OVW obviously came from different states and so they were there to offer advice, just getting settled. Uh, Steve Lewington was really helpful because we were signed at the same time. So he, you know, helped me, mm-hmm. you know, get an apartment at the apartment complex and things like that. Uh, Danny Davis was incredibly helpful uh, to me, you know, getting settled and things like that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, but everybody there, I mean, kind of is supported. In terms of, you know, coming and living in Kentucky, it was it was interesting because we're caught in so much of a bubble, mm-hmm. being a VW every day and that being the main people that you hang out with. So it's more like the culture shock was to suddenly be involved sure. in that world, you know, mm-hmm. say like a little bubble that you, that you then get to live in. Sure. And now uh, speaking of OVW, uh, who helped train mm-hmm. you while you were there? Was there anybody specific that you trained with? Um, I mean, Al Snow was the head trainer who is incredible, um, incredible teacher and just has so much, you know, insight and knowledge. Um, Danny Davis also, you know, he wasn't so much hands on wrestling training, but in terms of, because he was running the TV, so in terms of, you know, learning how to put storylines together and, you know, offering advice with that and things like that, he was really great. And, um... Rip Rogers as well. I went to his class a couple of times. So, yeah, I mean, lots of people. Sure. Really, yeah. 
And now, uh, you, you know, you were doing really well in OVW before getting called up to the main roster. Uh, uh-huh. Were you told any uh, maybe plans that they had for you prior to coming to Raw? I mean, was there anything else on on the table for you uh, before you uh, made your Raw debut? You mean besides the Intest Angle? Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, that was pretty much it, but then that had to, you know, obviously that died before it even came into fu- fu- what's the word, fruition. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess, you know, I had to do with it, you know, they were just switching over into the PG, into the more PG arena, so that was kind of the, um, you know, the, the transitional period for that, I mm-hmm. guess. So that was pretty much mixed before it even started, unfortunately. Yeah, and so I thought that could have been fun, but <laughs> well, you know, no. I think people people look at it in like a weird way, go, "Oh, incest," but it's. I mean, it's not like it's never been done before successfully mm-hmm. in film and television. Yeah, well, you know, it, it it can be done if it's done very well. It could be you know an intriguing angle, I think. Now, so I, from what you say right there, I mean, you weren't uncomfortable with that angle, were you? Or was anybody else maybe working with you that maybe wasn't quite sure about it? Or how was uh, uh, Paul with that angle? No, we were fine with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, I was looking forward to it. It was just, you know, unfortunate that it was just during that during that time period specifically. Sure. Um, now, what did you, do you have like a maybe your favorite moment in WWE? Uh, was there anything that happened, you know, that maybe stood out above the rest that you always think about? Mm. Huh. I don't know. I guess, oh, well, you know, I really loved the angle with Boogeyman, and I was very sad that that didn't play out until the end. Mm-hmm. You know, we really got unlucky with a couple of things where our angles were stopped short you know, due to, you know, talent transitioning to different brands or other things like that. So the thing with Boogeyman, I really wanted to sort of see out till the end. That was pretty magical. All right. Um, now, uh, after your departure from WWE, you moved on to TNA. Mm-hmm. Uh, were, yeah. you, were you happier to have more of a, uh, maybe a character-based gimmick there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing that I really, really loved the most was having a storyline that went from week to week to week, you know, that actually developed rather than having something that started and then stopped and then something else starting, you know, et cetera. So it was really, for me, it was really wonderful to have a whole year of doing one storyline that really, you know, developed week to week. Sure. Um, And uh, now that you had, you know, some time away from WWE and TNA, uh, mm-hmm. Is there which one did you maybe enjoy the most? Can you compare them, or was it like apples and oranges? Or well, I mean, it's kind of hard to say because you know I enjoyed both in terms of time spent there and the things that I got to do in the ring and things like that. I think you know creatively, the storyline thing with TNA really was you know special to me. So I would say if, if it was you know a contest. That would win, mm-hmm. but you know. Also, if I look back and look at some of the stuff that we did get to do in WWE, you know, the handicap ma- matches, you know, and the angles with Mickey and you know with Kofi and Ken Anderson and things like that, where I think, wow, we really had a lot of fun there too. All right. Um, now, you know, I always try to ask people like who they've you know had some of their favorite matches with, or you know, my question to you would be, have you? Uh, is there some you know? women out there that you've, uh, you know, th- that were your favorites to wrestle so far in your career? Do you have maybe any anybody favorite that you loved uh, working with? Yes, but I mean, there's so many. Mm-hmm. And I would dread this question because, you know, you start saying, oh, so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so, and at the end, <laughs> you start, you know, and then you stop listing them because you're like, okay, you know, five is enough. And then after you get off the phone, you go, oh, no, I forgot so-and-so, you know? So... But, yeah, definitely. I mean, I will say that, for example, Mickey James is definitely, sure. you know, one of the top people. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, you know, Gail Kim was great. And, oh, see, now I've started. Now I can't stop. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Uh, so, uh, in between wrestling for two major American companies, you spent some time in FWE in New York City. Uh, you, yes. you debuted for them in uh, t- 2011, and in February, mm-hmm. you returned to the company. Uh, is there any reason behind you coming back? Well, I kind of just, 
I think I got burned out for a minute. Mm -hmm. And I thought, let me not wrestle for a while and focus, you know, on a couple of other things. And then I went and did a convention for FWE um, a month or two ago in New York. And as I was sort of around it and I was hanging out with everyone, Jordan put to me, you know, why don't you do another match for us? I thought, you know what? I think that would be fun. <laughs> so that's kind of the story behind that. Nice. All right. Uh, now the current the current FWE Women's Champion is Candice LeRae. Uh, uh, what, yes. what are your thoughts on her? Well, I think she's amazing. I think she's been absolutely fantastic. I think that um, she's got the right, you know, combination of everything. She's obviously beautiful. She also can do a lot of stuff in the ring. She's fearless. She's she loves it. You know, that's one of the most important ingredients. And uh, she's, you know, her and Joey are making waves a little bit on the indie scene. So I think that's really exciting. It's a really exciting time for her. And so um, despite the fact that I said that, obviously I will be attempting to take that title away from her. Hmm. You know? Sure. So, you know, show her that, you know, the vet still has it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sure. And now, uh, besides wrestling, I know we talked a lot about wrestling. Uh, you currently have your own web series. Is there anything yes. you can tell us about that and where fans can check yeah. that out too? Yeah. Well, um, it's up at youtube.com forward slash red light diaries. I actually came off of shooting two scenes today and I did shot one scene yesterday. I uh, I shot the pilot um, in September and that's been up on YouTube since then, but I hadn't gotten around to you know, getting to, to the next episodes yet. So that's just started up and I'm extremely excited because it went really well and I've got some really amazing talent working on that. For example, mm -hmm. um, Joey Ryan is in the pilot episode, All which right. is uh, very exciting. And then also on what we shot yesterday and I had Shadi Martinez and Nick Sin Bodhi. Oh on the show and um, so yeah so it's all very very exciting nice so, yeah. and now uh, you know you've been on stage and screen before do you have any maybe upcoming projects people can check you out or is there anything on the back burner uh, in terms of me acting yeah yes uh, well so I did a sh uh, you know ind independent film called Middle of the Night a smaller role in that just recently so that will be um, coming out sometime next year, I think. And then I've been doing some Shakespeare and things like that. Um, so, and, you know, next Shakespeare play is coming up, I think, in June. So it'll be, uh, sorry, March. So there'll be details on that. Lightning round. What is your favorite thing about winter? The season, not the wrestler. <laughs> the snow. <laughs> I'm going back to Germany for Christmas, so I'll get to see some snow, so that'll be very nice. All right. Is there a, a best locker room story you can tell us briefly? Oh, goodness. No, not really. I'd have to think about that one. Maybe get back to you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> what are you doing for the holidays? Well, I am going to Germany, uh, where my parents are and my sisters, so I'm going to be spending the holidays with them, which is always wonderful. All right, and what is, what is your favorite women's wrestler of all time? Um, let me think. I would say probably. Um, I don't know. There's so many. I'll get back to you on that as well. All right, and now uh, would you ever go back to either WWE or TNA if you got the phone call? <laughs> You know, it's really sort of a question of scheduling and things like that because my focus is so much on, you know, acting and making films and things. So I wouldn't want to get caught up on a full-time basis again, you know. Sure. So, yeah, probably not. Lightning Round. Where can our fans keep up with you? Uh, website, social media? Right, so my website is katarinasinfamy.com. Uh, social media at katarinasinfamy is my Twitter. Facebook.com forward slash katarinasinfamy. Perfect. Ka uh, Katarina, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. 
All right, guys. Wow, what a show. Uh, thanks again to the CEO of FWE, Jordan Schneider, and uh, Winter for coming along and uh, talking to us. Yeah, we are excited for these shows. We've really been picking it up lately. Um, we're doing all this for you. So be sure to like us on all of the social media platforms that we have. Be sure to subscribe. Um, You're not doing it for me? Well, no. Um, rate, review, all that stuff. Buy a t-shirt, ProWrestlingTees.com. That's it, guys. I mean, every, anywhere and every, anything we talk about, just head on over to AnotherWrestlingPodcast.com because that's where you can find everything we were talking about. But Jonathan, you know what's happening next week? What's happening next week? Say that again. What's happening what's next, happening next week? week? Well, now that you said that, uh, we have a very special present for everybody because it is Christmas week for everybody celebrating Christmas. Sorry we missed Hanukkah. We can only do so much. But uh, Christmas is next week, and... We got some presents for uh, everybody listening, Jonathan. Uh, what are those? Well, first, we have none other than Old Saint Mick joining us. Uh, I don't want to get too much into it, but if you don't know who Old Saint Mick is, then come on now. He's real. real. That's creepy. But uh, <laughs> We want to thank you for listening today. We are an independent podcast. Every week we create something for you to listen to, and it's absolutely free we are a wrestling podcast for wrestling fans because after all we are wrestling fans if you enjoyed the show today here are some ways you can help us out first off you can subscribe to our show on itunes while you're there rate us and give us a good review why not if you're looking for more awp then head on over to another wrestling podcast.com to find out more about upcoming guests and where we will be Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and buy an official AWP shirt from ProWrestlingTees.com slash Another Wrestling Podcast. We couldn't do this show without you. So tune in next week for (sighs) Another Wrestling Podcast. Another Wrestling Podcast.